The story of Rocky Mountain construction is a success story. How a man flipped the roller coaster industry upside down, bringing his little company from garage to greatest. But RMC's success didn't come from rave reviews or the bottomless pit of golden ticket awards. It came because they were a problem-solving company. Fred Grubb began the company in 2001 as a rides builder and wooden coaster repairman. By operating as a wood coaster renovation company, he saw a side of the business most are unaware of. Parks would return to the same coaster year after year to replace sections of wood to keep the coaster running smooth. He offered an alternative steel rail solution, requiring less attending to and better equipped to handle higher forces. Talking about handling higher forces, this track can be bent in ways wood track could never. Pair that with the advances in computer design handled by coaster design veteran Alan Schilke, you have the winning formula. And win they did. Every next installment had more and more anticipation, until around 2018 when it reached an absolute height. And it seems every ride after that has been in the, is it the world's greatest? coaster debate. Now, if you want to get out of the business, it's better to sell the company while it's at a height. And that's exactly what Fred did. He sold the company, and both he and Alan retired. So, after a decade in the widely considered number one spot, reaching an all-time peak with their hyper-hybrids, followed by the lack of successful innovation in more recent years, with the change of leadership, the world running low on coasters to remodel, and intense hybrids being its own niche with a select clientele, what exactly about RMC's future is certain? I want to clarify, before I make my rounds through this video, I'm by no means suggesting RMC will struggle financially. They're now part of a much larger company that will see to that not becoming the case. But if they aren't getting those large payments from installs, that would, one, hurt the funding for innovation that would lead to a bigger company. And two, it would hurt RMC as a construction company, as they have a crew of over 100 strong who do all the fabrication and building in-house. Something that becomes a lot harder to care for if you don't have things to build. The game of coasters RMC is playing is the game of innovation, and we've seen the lengths other companies are willing to go to stick out. Today we're going through each concept RMC has developed over the years, listing them from worst to best. And I don't mean to be overly harsh about this first one, but it's last for a reason. The Wild Moose. I struggle to think of who would actually buy this. Maybe one, if at all. This concept more than likely came after RMC started working on rebuilding Fire in the Hole at Silver Dollar City. But really, what's going on with Fire in the Hole and what the Wild Moose is are two completely different things. I don't know if this is targeting family parks, large chains, fun spot, the dumpster behind fun spot, but really, even fun spot kind of already has one of these. So how do I fix it? Remake the layout so it doesn't look like Hurricane with an RMC identity crisis. Or, scrap it and put the resources into the Raptor 2.0. What about the most anticipated coaster model of this generation? The RMC T-Rex. Yeah, I regret to inform you that this is less likely now than it ever was, as interest in the Raptors didn't take off the way RMC would have hoped. Why put more resources into a Raptor sequel when the numbers for the original were not deserving of a sequel? And this was supposed to be a big sequel too, reaching heights between 3 and 500 feet. Making coasters crazy makes each install by RMC something awesome, but it leads to overall less installs because of how niche they are. Okay, you want a wood coaster or an extreme inverting wood coaster? You want a hyper coaster or a vertical drop hyper with inversions? You want a giga coaster or a single rail giga with inversions and extreme forces? Yeah, someone might be interested in forking over the tens of millions for a T-Rex, but the majority of parks would settle for a B&M because it's not risky, you know exactly what you're getting. Getting a little bit more theoretical, part of me also thinks this was a passion project for Alan Shoki. With so many great titles under his belt, he was never given the chance to giga throughout his career. This could have been his chance. But if we're going to change something about the T-Rex, it's to make it less intimidating. Shrink down the track a little bit and make it a hyper coaster, maybe something like Hyperia. Still, might not sell, but you have a much better chance than with a 500-foot Titan. When RMC started out with the iBox track, they also made a second option, the topper track. This is the same design as the iBox, but uses a wooden base, making it a wooden coaster. We've seen the topper woodies all get built from the ground up, and some of them have developed a rough reputation. I think this might be because of the high forces, 
forces that work well with the steel rail, but can cause more wear and tear on wooden tracks. I suggest using the topper track to fully retrack old wooden coasters without a severe change of layout. This is a better way to preserve a classic wooden coaster without turning it into a thrill coaster. And I think RMC knows this as they've offered up more retrack solutions in recent years. If they keep the topper track as a viable option, there may be some more sales in upcoming years when the newer gen woodies begin to get rough. The Raptors, on the other hand, are more feasible than its big brother, the T-Rex. The Raptor is a creative take on an I-beam for a rail, making it a single rail coaster. It's smart because the track being an I-beam acts as a support, meaning you can get away with using less supporting structure. These are intended to be wild whipping rides in the same nature of what made hybrids so popular. They are intense. Two parks took the bait buying prototypes, one being Six Flags. Six Flags then bought two clones and modified one. And then there's one at the closest park to the RMC headquarters at Silverwood. With the current trajectory, unless Six Flags goes on a buying spree, it won't be enough to sustain the company. But still, the Raptors are RMC's best chance at mass producing a ride that isn't a hybrid. So here's how I fix it. First things first, if you want to sell more of these, you need to lower the forces. Keep it a fun ride, yes, but expose it to a broader audience, reaching those local and regional parks they were created for. Second, if the forces are less, we need a more comfortable restraint system. The Raptor restraints are some of the most uncomfortable restraints out there, but they need to be like that to hold you in place through those crazy whipping transitions. If you lower the forces, we can get a more open feeling lap bar, like the Intamin version, the Hot Racer. And nowadays, launch coasters are becoming the norm, so I would either develop a new launch coaster design or use what you have, the Raptor. Once the Raptor 2.0 is complete, I would pitch the idea to none other than Funspot. After Airy Force 1, Funspot Orlando is overdue for a new coaster. I would bet Funspot will go with RMC on their next coaster. They might want a hybrid like Airy Force, but this would be a great time to put the Raptor 2.0 into the market. I love to say it, roller coasters are only as good as they are in the market. By pushing to get one built, it's no longer just a concept, but a full model to show how it operates. Plus, the Raptors were practically designed for a park like Funspot. The family coaster might seem small, but it has the potential to save RMC if all else fails. When it comes to a family coaster, RMC is late to the game. Most parks who would have considered this an option probably already bought one by the Gravity Group. With that said, there are far more family entertainment parks out there than there are huge corporate destination parks, making the family coaster a fine concept for RMC's catalog. But what if there was a whole new wave of conversion hybrids on the horizon? This gives RMC the chance to get their hands on a ride that wasn't quite big enough to make a thrilling hybrid, but works as a family coaster. Here's an example. Wildcat at Lake Compounds is one of the oldest coasters in the country. Lake Compounds has hopes to keep that ride around as long as they can. Option one, they can put some topper track on it like I suggested earlier. Or they can turn it into an RMC family coaster. And the big draw here is it can be marketed toward the same clientele it is to currently, while also repairing the structure and replacing the track to keep the ride around for years to come. I think RMC operates best when it sticks to its roots, a roller coaster repair company. If any new concept doesn't take off, they can use the family coaster to bring more conversions to the table. The Woody is said to be too small to be RMC'd. Their most successful innovation is the iBox Hybrid. I think the large portfolio of retrofits RMC has accumulated over the years is enough to convince smaller parks who may be more protective over their investments that trusting RMC with their old wooden coaster is the way to go. But there's a whole other side to the iBox track. The coasters Iron, Gwazi, and Zadra have what I call the RMC formula. When interest in retrofits came to a slow and Steel Vengeance pushed the hybrid heights to 200 feet, there was a new market for 200 foot hyper hybrids. It sounds obvious, but the RMC formula is the best chance RMC has to continue growth, but it really strays from how the company started, offering up a good cheap coaster because most of the structure was already built. And hyper hybrids are very niche rides. The three parks who own a hyper hybrid are exactly the ones you'd expect to get a hyper hybrid. The coaster record capital of the world, Cedar Point, pushed for a 200 foot hybrid, becoming the father of the hyper hybrid. Busch Gardens Tampa had huge potential from the colossal Gwazi structure. Reusing 80% of those footers, they built 
a hyper hybrid. And Energy Landia collects roller coasters like Infinity Stones. The RMC formula doesn't only mean hyper coasters. Airy Force 1 stays true to this formula. Like I said, I think building retrofits and ground up hybrids is the best strategy for RMC going forwards. I believe more of these will sell, but not to the likes of, say, a B&M Hyper. If you catch the trend here, RMC isn't great at getting new concepts successfully into the market, and I think a lot of that resorts back to them being a problem-solving company. RMC found an unanswered demand and offered up a profitable solution, and they were very good at it. Hybrids are the identity of RMC. They are the rides we want more and more of. But how many more can they make? Behind all the records, RMC is a coaster repair company. That's when they're at their strongest. From Fred Grubb's perspective, it was successful. He did exactly what he set out to do. Perhaps he sold the company because it was the right time. It was the end of an era. I fear RMC's purpose was hybrid conversions and they serve their purpose. Don't get me wrong, it's just not possible for RMC to get their hands on every potential candidate. So, until the very end of this company, we can always expect an iBox conversion from any park who's up for it. So either the new owner stays true to RMC's fixer-upper core beliefs, which was best run by Mr. Grubb, or they change the way it operates to sell more cookie-cutter concepts, which to me makes the future very uncertain. Gambling on selling more Zadros and Air Force Ones is the safest bet going forwards, but what happens when it comes to a slow? B&M doesn't make a living by only selling hypercoasters. If anything about RMC's future is certain, they need now more than ever to branch out into new concepts or else they will never reach their full potential. Unless you count Steel Vengeance their full potential. Then there you go. Talking about potential, this channel is getting really close to 10,000 subscribers. If you enjoyed this video, help push us over that milestone. Or else you're sentenced to get a wild moose at your home park. Thank you all for watching. I'm Zach, and I will catch you in the next one.